Hello, I'm James Johnson, the CEO at Geoscience Australia. As I begin today, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking to you today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and note that their living cultures are among the oldest in human history. People have met in this region, exchanged ideas, exchanged wisdom and insights for thousands of years, and our gathering today will sustain this tradition. I pay respect to Aboriginal elders of the community and I extend my recognition to their descendants, the future leaders, and other Indigenous people who are present with us today. We're here today to highlight the achievements of the Exploring for the Future program, the overarching aim of which is captured in its name. In this program, we're exploring Australia's continental crust and we're looking for mineral, energy and groundwater prospects concealed beneath the surface, all to support future growth and sustainability of Australia's industries and communities. But we're at a very particular moment in our history, a time in which the way we think about the future is changing as the world responds to COVID-19. This pandemic brings new perspective on how we think about the future. The impacts of COVID-19 are very significant and very wide reaching. And so we're all asking ourselves, what will the world look like beyond the pandemic? How does our economy, our society recover? As Australia rebuilds its economy after COVID, we have an opportunity to support the growth of existing industries but also to kickstart new and emerging ones. I see a smarter, more connected future in, for Australia where in real time, for example, farmers will know the well-being of their crops and stock and they can control automated machinery to centimetre scales in their fields and they can do all of this from the kitchen table. I see natural resource managers monitoring the quality and quantity of waters in rivers, reservoirs and even underground and they can use a wealth of baseline information to forecast changes and optimise their use of resources. I see emergency workers and community leaders that can monitor emerging hazards and warn and protect their communities. Now, enabling and powering all of these real-time networks will be low emissions technology, creating renewable energy and processing the information and linking all of the pieces together. We have an opportunity to harness Australia's competitive advantages, including, of course, our natural resources, to strengthen existing industries and to embrace the future by starting whole new industries. Renewable energy, electric vehicles, large-scale battery storage and high-tech sensors and tools, they're already here and their presence in our everyday lives is rapidly increasing. As we transition to a low-carbon economy, will be well supported by lower emissions energy sources, like natural gas, to balance energy demand and supply. We'll be embarking on the journey to become a major exporter of hydrogen by 2030. And all with a close eye on how we best live on the driest inhabited continent on Earth, where water is a critical component of everything we do. This new infrastructure will require the materials to build it, this is where Australia's competitive advantage really lies. The resources sector is a fundamental part of Australia's modern economy. It's carried us in the past through challenges and it provides a way forward now. Critical minerals will be essential to Australia's advanced manufacturing and energy sectors. A single wind turbine requires three to four tonnes of copper, for example. The batteries that store the energy generated by that turbine will be built from lithium and cobalt. And the many devices we rely on day to day, including the one that you're watching me on right now, consist of over 20 metals. Australia can produce these minerals to support not only export, but combined with our indigenous energy supplies to also support an integrated value chain through the domestic manufacturing sector. Water is another resource that underpins Australian industries, particularly the agricultural industry. And of course, it's not just industry. Reliable water is critical for all Australian communities. For example, Alice Springs and nearby communities are completely dependent on groundwater. And agricultural ventures like fruit trees or even hay can typically use the equivalent of an Australian Olympic-sized swimming pool 
uh, per hectare per year. We need better understanding of Australia's water, water resources so that we can optimise and sustain their use. And so, in thinking about Australia's mineral, energy and groundwater resources, we can see there is opportunity for Australia, an opportunity to recover from the impact of the pandemic and build a more sustainable, economically robust future. Australia is rich in many of these natural resources. As a nation, we have a wealth of metals and critical minerals. We're rich in natural gas. We have enormous agricultural potential if we can find and carefully manage the water resources. These resources in regional and remote parts of the country represent an enormous opportunity to create jobs and drive new infrastructure projects to build those local economies and to ensure, ensure prosperity for future generations across the whole nation. The first phase of Exploring for the Future set out in 2016 to address the strategic need for more geoscience information in Northern Australia. And I'm pleased to report that the program's been a great success. If you've viewed the other Roadshow presentations, you'll know that from a scientific perspective, the program has been enormously productive. We've delivered nearly 200 new data sets and technical reports. We've covered more than 3 million square kilometres of the continent with geophysical surveys and created images of the Earth's crust and lithosphere down to 200 kilometres. All of this data is freely available through our digital catalogue and our world-leading data discovery portal. The portal includes cutting-edge 3D visualisation and analytical tools that can create maps to support your analysis and decision-making. I encourage you to visit the portal at eftf.ga.gov.au to have a look around and start making discoveries of your own from the data. These scientific outputs are already translating into real impacts that are building towards a smarter, more connected future. Geoscience Australia set out to encourage investment and we are seeing increases in exploration investment that can be directly attributed to this pre-competitive geoscience work. Since 2018, a collective area of more than 80,000 square kilometres of exploration tenements between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa have seen new applications and new investment. That's an area greater than the whole of Tasmania. Importantly, this new interest is in greenfield areas that have only seen limited exploration in the past. In addition, the program has stimulated work program commitments valued at close to $100 million in the South Nicholson Basin, which is an emerging petroleum play. The Exploration for the Future program has changed perceptions and changed behaviours in the minerals and petroleum industries. In fact, an independent analysis of the program's projected economic impacts indicates that the return on the government's investment will be substantial. The report considered three projects that represent $40 million of investment under the program. The returns from the potential discovery and development of new mineral and energy resources were estimated by ASIL Allen to range from $446 million under the most conservative of modelling to more than $2.5 billion under the most optimistic scenario. Any investments in mining and agricultural operations will also create opportunities for employment in regional Australia, supporting economic recovery in regions where opportunities might otherwise be limited. Large mines, of course, can directly employ thousands of people, and indirect employment can be several times that. Importantly, this brings with it opportunity for significant levels of employment for Aboriginal Australians in those regional areas. These benefits further demonstrate the importance of the resources sectors as engines of the Australian economy, engines that are needed more than ever in the economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to these outcomes, I also want to highlight the development of innovative methods and the resulting benefits for Australia. A small Australian startup company specialising in passive geophysical methods, companies called Odyssey Geophysics, was contracted during Exploring for the Future to deploy a large array of passive seismic geophysical instruments in some of the most remote and difficult to access areas in Northern Australia. 
There were many technical challenges that they faced, but they overcame them. They persisted and found solutions to make the method a much more robust operation. Odyssey Geophysics had only a couple of employees when they first started working on the Exploring for the Future program. But building on the success of deployments, they now employ 10 people and the company is further refining their method for exploration companies to search for new resources under the surface. This demonstrates how the program has stimulated not only new jobs, but also innovation and opportunities for Australian companies to lead the world. The opportunities and benefits I've just described have inspired the extension of Exploring for the Future for a second phase. On the 23rd of June, the Honourable Keith Pitt, Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, announced a $125 million extension and expansion of the Exploring for the Future program over the next four years. The emphasis of this phase is to take the program national, which means a greater focus on the southern half of the continent. This is a fantastic opportunity to continue our use of innovative and cutting edge geoscientific techniques to expand the national coverage of deep data sets and to take deep dives into new regions to encourage further greenfield exploration. The program will demonstrate Geoscience Australia's commitment to the nation's post-COVID-19 economic recovery and will create jobs where they are needed in regional and remote communities, both now and into the future. Over the last four years, Exploring for the Future has delivered over 300 contracts worth $69.4 million and created hundreds of jobs. We expect similar outcomes in the new phase with jobs in surveying, sample and data collection, processing and analysis through exploration activities and, in time, through resource development projects. These, in turn, will provide economic stability and growth across the nation and particularly in regional communities. We're now in the early stages of our planning for the new phase of the program and events like this virtual discussion panel are a great opportunity to hear from our stakeholders and understand what the key achievements are to date and how we can best deliver future benefits. I look forward to hearing their ideas. In wrapping up, I'd like to express my personal gratitude to our partners in the Geological Surveys and the Water Management Departments in Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory. The success of the first phase of the program was achieved through productive collaborations and co-funding to facilitate land access and also collect and interpret new data. I look forward to continuing and building on those relationships. I'd also like to warmly thank the traditional owners, landholders, businesses and communities who have supported us through the program so far. We've learned a lot from you and we're very excited to build our relationships with communities right across Australia. Finally, I'd like to thank the skilled and dedicated staff at Geoscience Australia. They've created so much valuable knowledge during four years of scientifically and logistically challenging work in remote regions of the country. These challenges have inspired a new generation of data acquisition methods and innovative tools for data delivery which places Australia at the forefront of resources geoscience globally. Meeting these challenges has further honed our skills, our capabilities and our culture. We're proud to support a key part of Australia's economic recovery. I look forward to providing you with future updates on our progress and outcomes as the program progresses. Thank you and I'll now hand over to Andrew to start the panel discussion. Thank you, James, for that wonderful overview of the achievements of Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program and how that work has encouraged new investment in resource projects across Northern Australia. Welcome, everyone, to the final virtual roadshow event for the Exploring for the Future program, the panel discussion. My name is Andrew Heap. I'm the Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia, and I have the great honour in leading the teams that have produced the world-leading and groundbreaking science from the Exploring for the Future program. If you've attended the previous sessions of the Virtual Roadshow, you may remember that last week at the introductory plenary session, I spoke about the need for unlocking Australia's mineral, energy and groundwater resources to create that pipeline of opportunities for the future, to drive economic growth, create jobs and support communities. A key aim of Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program 
was to make that material difference in our understanding of the minerals, energy and groundwater resource potential across Northern Australia. And based on what I've seen this week, I think we can say we've achieved that aim. We've collected new data at an unprecedented scale and using technology and cutting edge techniques, as James uh, said in his introduction, covering more than 3 million square kilometres and culminating in more than 250 new data sets and technical reports. These new data have been combined with Geoscience Australia's existing knowledge, accrued over more than 70 years as the nation's trusted geoscience organisation to generate more than four terabytes of publicly available data. But generating the data is just the first step. Key to the success of the Exploring for the Future program has been our innovative approach to integrating and delivering these data sets for use by all stakeholders. Our online data delivery portal demonstrates our capability as a world leader in implementing science and technology to support resource exploration, use and protection. Through quick and easy access to relevant information and application of sophisticated decision support tools. Today, we've brought together representatives from the key industries, minerals, energy and groundwater, to hear their perspectives on how the achievements of Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program to date are supporting their businesses and their industries more broadly. And importantly, how the program can be shaped to meet future needs. I want to thank all of the panel members for giving up their time today to participate in this open forum. So it's my time for the panel. It's now my pleasure to introduce first panel member, Peter Berwick from Encounter Resources. Peter is a geologist with over 30 years of industry experience, including 14 years with Western Mining Corporation, an exploration manager and geology manager roles across Australia and North America. These and other roles have provided Peter extensive experience in project generation for a range of commodities, including nickel, gold, copper and bauxite. He has been an executive director with Encounter Resources Limited since the listing of the company in 2006. Our second panel member is Holly Bridgewater from Unearthed. Holly is an exploration geologist, open innovation lead at Unearthed, and an advocate for industry adoption of open data initiatives. Holly works with teams across the mining industry to identify and articulate problems that suit machine learning and sources of solution and sources solutions from globally distributed network of expert data scientists. Currently, Holly is working with the South Australian government on a large on the largest ever government-led open data competition, Explore SA, the Gawla Challenge. Our third panelist is Phil Commander, a water consultant. Phil's career has spanned 38 years as a hydrogeologist with the Geological Survey of WA and the WA Department of Water, subsequently consulting mainly to state and Commonwealth organisations. His interest in Northern Australia stems from work in the Kimberley, at Broome, Derby, the Fitzroy River and the Ord River Irrigation Area. He has led groundwater resource investigations, hydrogeological mapping, and has advised on groundwater management throughout Western Australia. He has also been a member of the National Water Commission's Groundwater Technical Advisory Committee. And our fourth panellist today is John Ellis Flint from Blue Energy. John is an Australian-born businessman and petrologist with only 40 years of global hydrocarbon industry experience. John has acted as a technical advisor to a number of governments following a 26-year international career at Unocal Corporation, serving in a variety of senior executive roles in global exploration, development, production, strategy, and technological functions. John was also Managing Director of, and CEO of Santos Limited from 2000 to 2008, and is a distinguished alumni of the University of New England and former chairman of the South Australian Museum. Welcome to you all. So now we'll move into the discussion forum. While I have a few questions already planned for our panel, we'd love to know what you want to hear about too. So if there's a question or a topic you would like to see our panel discuss today, please enter it into the Q&A box on your screen. I'll endeavour to get through as many of the questions and discussion topics as possible in the time we have available today. Any audience questions that we don't get to, we'll answer in a direct email to the questioner at a later date. So while you're thinking of your question topics, why don't I kick things off with a question to the panel? So, as we've just heard from our CEO, Dr. James Johnson, in his introduction, we are already seeing the data and information delivered from Exploring for the Future program producing positive outcomes in industry and communities. So, from your perspective, what have been the greatest benefits of, Explo of the Exploring for the Future program to your business, industry or communities more generally? And secondly, how do you see the new data being used? Perhaps I could throw to you first, Peter. 
Well, thanks very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of the uh, virtual roadshow. It's a great opportunity. Um, just by way of background, uh, Encounter Resources is a greenfields exploration company primarily focused currently in Western Australia. And almost exclusively our greenfields work uh, focuses on the uh, Patterson project, uh, Patterson province, where we have a joint venture with Independence Group and also joint ventures with Newcrest in both the Arunta and, uh, and the Tanami district. So we're very much all in on the Protozoic basins uh, when it comes to our mineral exploration and greenfields efforts. So certainly uh, we've been looking to springboard those uh, learnings that we've made over the last decade or so in these districts into other parts of Australia. But one of the real, uh, I guess, problems we've had is being able to provide some some level of context to some of the ideas or or ideas we've had into generating new greenfields opportunities. So certainly exploring for the future has provided massive a massive springboard and a massive opportunity for us to use the array of data and the array of uh, information provided uh, through the four-year work program uh, to allow us to provide the context we need to to get out there and be bold. And I certainly believe when calling up and looking at the um, looking at this, what I think will become an iconic image in years to come when you look at the, uh, the successes, I think, that, that in Exploring for the Future will bring in. Now, while some people look at that image and think it might be an aerial photograph of the Mars rover mission, it is in fact the, uh, the beautiful lands of the Barclay uh, Tablelands. And, and a lot of people would look at that and say, well, you know, that's just too much, just too hard. We can't see a rock sticking out of the ground. But I see that as just a fantastic opportunity. And if I could uh, encourage others to look harder at some of the information, you know, we look at that, the black soil plains and say, well, how deep are they? Are, you know, can we use geochemistry? Can we actually identify a distal footprint? Well, we've been, we've had crews out in the Barclay and in an area we've worked in, we've got one and a half meters of black soil and then we're in, uh, and then we're in solid rock potentially hosting uh, the next great tier one mineral discovery. So don't be scared, get out, you know, the, what what Geoscience Australia has done has provided a, a fantastic opportunity to use what I would call a supercharged pre-competitive data sets to identify the camp scale opportunities, to work into, into districts that, you know, we've, uh, when I look at um, the the tenement pickup maps that, that you've been talking about, the area of Tasmania or, or Ireland that have been used as a, an indication of success of the program. Um, Encounter is actually uh, Boudin Resources. So uh, I thank Geoscience Australia for colouring it the same colour as my football team, which is very, uh, uh, very good of you. Um, but we're, you know, we're responsible for almost 10,000 square kilometres of tenure in the Tizer area. Uh, we've started exploration activities, although um, tenements are just coming to grant now. Um, but we've uh, started collecting data. We've been extremely encouraged by the early signs of what we're seeing. We're not only looking at now conceptual, solid, plausible uh, conceptual targets, we're now seeing empirical support for uh, what is or what could be the distal footprints of, of, of a tier one mineral system. So we're extremely encouraged, we're extremely enthusiastic, and I look forward to, to seeing more of this data uh, over greater areas and, and hopefully generating more quality opportunities for, for the next uh, tier one base metal discovery uh, in Australia. So uh, uh, that's, that's my summary. Thanks so much for the opportunity again, Andy. Thanks, Peter. Fantastic. Uh, John, uh, we'll go to you next from, a, from an energy perspective. Hi, John, maybe you're on mute. Okay, sorry, we can't hear you, John. Um, maybe we'll move to Phil, uh, sorry, um, to continue the, uh, the perspectives and while we sort out John's microphone. 
Well, th thank you, Andrew, for the for the opportunity to um, look at all the EFTF um, programs. It's really um, quite a spread of things. Um, the groundwater projects range from green fields um, to brown fields and hardy perennials. So there's a big range of groundwater um, activities carried out on sort of pretty small scale areas. I'm particularly interested in the one in Western Australia, of course, which is the Bona Park Basin. That was a um, it's a, it's a new basin from a groundwater point of view. There was when it was put on the national hydrogeological map in 1985. Uh, there was a petroleum well and some coal exploration wells, I think, which um, which had flows of fresh water. So the potential was there, um, but no groundwater work had been done until 30 years later. The Agri Agriculture Agency and WA um, looked at the Cockatoo Sands as a as an agricultural prospect, and um, that led into the EFTF um, investigation, which was a pretty comprehensive investigation and has shown the tremendous potential um, of using groundwater there to irrigate on the, uh, the cockatoo sands. So I think that's, that's, that's a major achievement in itself. The other uh, programs, well, they range from uh, uh, looking at the environmental aspects of, um, of um, groundwater contribution to stream flow and vegetation. So the Daly River is a hardy perennial which has been looked at um, a number of times, and the basalt um, aquifers in um, the McBride and other provinces in Queensland, where the um, where the aquifer supports the um, uh, flow in the Upper Burdekin and springs there, um, these are, are pretty necessary things to understand before going to a management plan to uh, then um, allocate water for consumptive use, because we um, we basically have to have a an understanding of the dependencies of groundwater before we can we can allocate to um, um, to um, consumptive use. And a challenge across northern Australia is um, the fact that um, there's plenty of water in the wet season, uh, but in the dry season, it's groundwater that maintains the surface water um, expressions. And so, in a lot of cases, it's difficult, as we've seen in the Western Australia's Fitzroy. Um, river, it, it's difficult to envisage uh, major groundwater withdrawals when there's such an environmental dependency at the end of the dry season um, on, on groundwater. And uh, the, um, I, I think the, uh, the McBride um, basalt shows how um, episodic recharge is really important across northern Australia. The, the, the water levels have been falling gradually since um, Cyclone Yazi in uh, 2011. Um, so it's very difficult to get a perspective of uh, what is the long term trend when you've got these um, episodic events which may be happening only over periods of decades. So that's another challenge for water managers really to, um, to understand what the uh, recharge conditions are. The, um, um, and, and then through to the the uh, hardy perennials of uh, the Row Creek bore field at Alice Springs. Um, investigations have been going on there for 60 years, and they'll continue to go on there for, for a long time to come um, because the water levels are declining, so essentially mining the groundwater in that case. Um, and uh, I note that uh, there was some work done on MAR looking at managed aquifer recharge. Well, probably that would be a prime case for, uh, for doing that. Um, what are the major achievements on the program as a whole? Well, they're incremental on a lot of those things, and I'll perhaps mention the Western Davenport too as an emerging um, agricultural area too. That um, does seem that uh, a, bit, a bit more knowledge of the what aquifer systems are there is needed. Um, there's obviously fresh water, um, and that's tied up perhaps with the story of Paleo Valleys in Central Australia. Um, I think that's a, that's a great story and. Uh, it needs um, needs further investigation on that. Are there other tea tree basins, for instance? What's the agricultural potential? Um, these are things that we we should know and get get on. Um, the major outcome, I think, of um, all those programs together is the multidisciplinary um, nature of the investigations. And um, GA has been able to put in uh, drilling, novel downhole geophysical techniques. Combine that with aerial electromagnetics. Um, combine that with um, 
NBID, the Greenness Index for looking at vegetation, and LIDAR, um, all, these, all these new data sets um, all wrapped together, which gives us a lot of confidence in knowing how the groundwater systems work. And these are, ex these are um, is an expertise that is not held by um, state water agencies. So uh, GA is in a pretty unique position to, uh, to carry out these sort of holistic investigations. So I congratulate GA, GA on that. Uh, on that, that aspect. Um, how, how is the new data being used? Well, these, th this will all um, contribute to um, the groundwater management plans, which is um, the, the province of the state agencies. Um, it's really necessary to have good science to back up our, our management when you go out to the public to get social license on these things. Um, having a good scientific report behind you um, it is, is pretty necessary. So, thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Bill. It's a, a very comprehensive answer. And uh, yeah, the multidisciplinary approach was something that we really wanted to bring to this this program. And uh, I think you're right. I think the uh, extensive capabilities across our organization and plus with our collaborative partners uh, uh, also attest to that and it allows us to leverage all those different capabilities to bring that holistic understanding. Uh, Holly, I might jump to you now and see from your perspective um, what your perspectives are on how it's, what the greatest benefits of the program would be. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks very much for, for inviting me on as well. It's a great, great opportunity. So I think I'll probably build a little bit on, um, on what uh, Peter was saying in the sense that uh, I think the, the work that GA have done, and particularly in the region between um, Tennant Creek and Mount Isa, understanding uh, uh, the mineral systems in a relatively underexplored uh, area is hugely valuable and I guess kind of building on, on some of the roadmaps that the Uncover, Uncover project um, developed. And, and this is work that really as uh, individual explorers, we can't really carry out ourselves. So that work in terms of deeply understanding that, that region um, is hugely valuable. And the way that, that GA has done that with uh, these kind of new t different techniques, uh, combining lots of different geophysical methods and really building on that understanding. And I think you can see the result of that in, in you know, the map that Peter showed and, and the tenements that have been um, put in for application there. I think that's a real demonstration of, of that the work that GA has done is very practical for explorers to use in their investment decisions and has really enabled them to kind of build an understanding of that, of that region and take those investment decisions to go and explore there so i think that's a real a real marker of success and i'm really excited to see um i'm sure there will be some major discoveries in that in that area and i'm really excited to to see uh, what they are uh, but i think the, the key that you kind of touched on before is um collecting those data sets and building that understanding is really important but in addition to that actually making that data available for people to use in the way that they need to use it to to, to make those kind of uh, decisions is, has been really key. So the portal and the way that you've made uh, the data accessible is, I think, a key success point because it's really crucial in terms of enabling people to to use the work that's that's been done. So um, I think that would that would definitely be be uh, my two major things for success. So thanks. Thanks, Holly. Yes, and we've got some uh, other questions around data too that we can we can talk about later. But but thank you for that initial perspective. Uh, John, I believe we have you now, so happy to uh, hear your perspective too. Thanks. Sorry, John, we, we don't seem to have you. I'm sorry about that. We, we probably should move on now to the to the next question. Um, and our producers will, will look at uh, trying to get you logged in in a second. So thank you. Okay, there's a question from the uh, from the from the audience today, and it says, uh, which I think is uh, a good time to answer it, which was, why was North, the northern part of Australia explored as opposed to the southern part? I guess this is a question for myself. Um, was there something more geologically attractive to northern part or something else? So I can I can provide a perspective on that, um, and uh, really the northern Australia, when the program was being uh, devised, um, there was a, a push by government to to look at Northern Australia because it did, in their view, and also else from a geological perspective, offer great opportunities for untapped um, or untapped opportunities and vast areas of, of our Northern 
uh, lands are, are underexplored and unexplored. And really the, the concept behind the program was where we thought we could make the biggest material difference to our understanding of, of the resource potential. And that was the primary driver for looking in Northern Australia. There was an, uh, an agenda to work there and support economic development in Northern Australia from the government's perspective. And from a technical perspective or geological perspective, it was really about trying to make that biggest material difference. Um, so, so that's why we went there. And I think, you know, as we've seen uh, throughout the week, that there's fantastic uh, opportunities and fantastic uh, examples of where we've actually made the, those huge strides in knowledge and understanding. Okay, perhaps we can uh, move on to the next question and perhaps we'll come back to John uh, in a few moments. So sort of relate to that a little bit is that um, Australia, as we've heard, is the driest inhabited continent and everything we do in the agricultural and resources sectors and in the communities has to carefully consider where we get water from and how we best manage it. In Northern Australia, that source is quite often from groundwater, as we've heard from Phil. And Phil is the groundwater expert on the panel, so I'll start with him again, but I'm keen to hear from all the panellists on, on this. What groundwater resources does your industry need and what do you see as the key gaps and challenges we're facing to better understand those resources? Uh, and then I'll come on to a second part of the question. I guess the ultimate goal really is about establishing a, a national inventory of the groundwater quality and quantity. And uh, I'm not sure if that is the holy grail, so to speak, I'd be interested in hear from Phil and other people's perspective as to whether that's achievable, and if so, what sort of an inventory would be, uh, how it would, could be used. Phil, can I can I start with you, please? Well, I would be a little bit sceptical about um, national inventories. Back in 1975, as a fairly young hydrogeologist, I provided the estimates for Review 75, which um, which included storage, groundwater storage. So if you take the Canning Basin and apply a few thicknesses to it and the porosity, you come up with a huge figure. Um, it, but it's not, it's not really useful to anyone. Um, I think people, people aren't asked this question of how much water does Australia have? That is not the question we ask. The question is how much are we willing or at what rate are we willing to use our groundwater? And as I touched on before, well, a lot of the projects um, are to do with looking at the environmental dependencies. Uh, they are looking at what um, we can safely um, allocate. Um, so um, a national inventory is not, not terribly useful. For instance, the Great Artesian Basin. Yes, there are figures on how much water there is in that. But the decision has been made to allocate water on the basis of maintaining artesian pressure. So it's not a quantity issue at all. It's totally irrelevant how much water is in the basin. It's really a question of how do you want to manage the heads, the artesian heads. Um, and the same is true of other areas, not quite in the same in managing heads, but in managing other aspects of the um, of environmental dependencies and how much, uh, what rate do you want to water, what, what, what rate of water level decline is acceptable. Um, so the, these, are, these are more the questions. Okay, there are a few cases like Western Australian goldfields where the decision is that you can mine hypersaline water. Um, that's pretty um, unusual in that sense. So yes, we are concerned about calculating storage and how long is it going to last. Well, um, here we are 30 years after the first Paleo Channel borefields were put in and that, that aquifer is still, still going. Um, so there are a variety of questions there, but I would step away from looking at a national inventory. It's not really possible to do that, and it's um, it, it, it would be um, uh, you know it's a waste of time. But um, uh, <laughs> we could probably spend our time doing something better. What it does give, of course, a storage figure does give you confidence. You know you've got a big storage. You know that you can overdraw in drought. Um, if necessary. So, yes, it is a factor. It makes, it's a factor of robustness on the aquifer. Um, but the problem with a lot of aquifers is there's a lot of water down below, but you can't use the top because of the water level constraints that you have at the top, either pressure or uh, spring discharge. So the, the, the McBride Battle, for instance, is a, an interesting case where 
where it um, supports the uh, flow in the burdekin, the upper burdekin. Um, so that would be a constraint on, on, on using that. So it doesn't really much matter how much water is in there. It's a question of how much you can pull out without affecting those environmental um, aspects. And as I said about the challenge, well, how often does it recharge? Um, it's hard to say that, uh, given, given our span of data is it, not long enough. We haven't been here measuring water levels long enough to, to really understand that. So um, uh, that, was, that was part of your question. What was the other one? Have I answered well, that? Well, it was about is it a challenge. Yeah, about the challenges that we face, and uh, you've touched on that. Um, I guess part of the recharge question is, you know, how often it rains and what sort of level, what sort of size of events cause most of the recharge versus, um, you know, keeping it ticking along. Uh, do you want perspectives around that? And, and I guess we're interested in understanding how programs like Exploring for the Future can provide information to help answer those sorts of questions. Well, yes, I mean, that's the incremental, uh, um, um, like the, uh, the, the current current um, joint program. So um, all those uh, programs have been um, in, um, uh, in, in concert with the state agencies, so the Agriculture Department Agency in, in Western Australia, for instance, with the Cockatoo Sands and the Bonaparte, the uh, Water Supply Agency in the Northern Territory for the Howard East, Darwin, Boarfield and Alice Springs, and for the Water Management Agencies in Northern Territory, and um, um, and Queensland on the environmental aspects. Um, so those are the squeaky wheels that 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 require oiling. It's the management problems which which come up. What I see is that GA has a role in looking at a national perspective. And so instead of doing a national inventory, why not look at the holes in the map? There are vast areas of the map which we know very little. So my hobby horse, I suppose, is the Canning Basin. It was said in the energy um, uh, seminar that, that the Canning Basin is the world's least known Paleozoic basin. Um, it's Australia's second largest artesian basin, yet we have only developed and uh, investigated just along the coastline. We have no idea what the flow systems are like inland. So there's a vast area of Australia there that we infer there's water there, but we're not really quite sure on the um, uh, on the uh, on the water quality. We're not sure, quite sure whether it's fresh or not. Um, I think there's uh, there's there's a need really to fill some of those gaps to provide some basic knowledge. We don't need a not lot of knowledge about it because it's under the Great Sandy Desert. No one goes there. But I think from a national perspective, we're always crying poor about water, but we don't actually make we don't actually find out what we've got um we don't actually make the best of it um so that that's really uh, that that was really where i would be coming from um i'd like to see more exploration in those gaps in the map where we know nothing essentially <clears throat> so <clears throat> yes we have to spend some time and money on um on immediate things like Alice Springs and uh, Darwin's water supply and stop it from going saline. But we should spend a little bit of money on looking at the way out things um, that nobody's interested in, but which are holes in Australia's map. Um, that's my plea, plea for it. I mean, Australia's been very, the mining industry is very successful basically on finding processed bore fields. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hamper a big operation. I mean, there are some operations which would be marginal because they're not near water resources. But when you look at the Olympic dams, they go 100, 110 kilometres, I think it is, to their bore field in the Great Artesian Basin. So that's not a big problem. Other mines have, have their own water supplies like that. Uh, groundwater consultants spend all their time looking for processed bore fields for, for, for water. And maybe quality is not quite the issue here. So it's it's not as bad as you think, uh, or it's not as bad as people think, probably. They think it's a waterless, dusty environment. But um, but I don't think mining is really hampered by lack of water. Um, we think we're pretty successful in, 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 in getting past that. Back to you, Andrew. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Phil. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to 
Peter, for a mining perspective um, uh, on the water water challenge that we face. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, water and water resources uh, play a role in in every part of the mining uh, industry, from sticking our very first exploration camp in the middle of nowhere uh, and drilling a hole to obviously uh, mining an operation, as and as Philip mentioned, obviously defining and, and understanding the process water opportunities or resources that we have in the area to actually process our, our ores and develop uh, and produce our concentrates and our metals. So um, we are very much uh, from the very first day on a project to the very last um, keen and, uh, and to understand the nature of the groundwater systems. Uh, it obviously feeds our communities that we, we draw uh, employees from and, and local uh, contractors. It also, uh, as I mentioned, leads on to um, how we design our mills. Like, does the quality of the water impact on the uh, the engineering of a of a plant, for instance? Do we need? And I'm not an expert in um, in groundwater and and the importance and the impacts it have on on specific design uh, capabilities. But I know dealing with the hypersaline water in Western Australia. Um, can cause some difficulties with uh, flotations and so forth. So the use of an understanding of the quality of the water, I believe is essential. And and one thing I think that has come out of the Exploring for the Future program and something we're very excited about is that the groundwater has one of those unique opportunities to be one of the only mediums that, that may come into contact with a mineral deposit at depth uh, under the, the deep cover that we're exploring in. So understanding the chemistry, the metal distribution in the water, uh, what sort of footprints you might see in groundwater and the quality of that groundwater might have around a mineral deposit, uh, I think is is, a, is the science that I think is gonna be one of the great um, benefits of the Exploring for the Future program is the understanding of how to use groundwater to vector in to mineral deposits and what sort of elements and what sort of uh, uh, footprints would be developed around, uh, for instance, a sulphide ore body buried. Uh, and I think at this point in time, you know, we tend to look at, you know, if water comes out of a hole, well, it comes from, you know, X depth. Uh, but there are obviously multiple aquifers uh, throughout Australia, different depths. Can we assay or can we analyse the different waters in those aquifers and potentially uh, see more concentrated um, anomalies or footprints from a deposit that may sit in contact with one particular aquifer. And I think that's a, that's an area where I think I'd like to see more understanding of exactly, you know, where is the water coming from that we're actually sampling in some of the water uh, bore field um, hydrogeochemical samplings we've been taking, but also um, can we map out in 3D what that water is doing and, and then use that as a as a plane which we can vector back into. So I think groundwater has, and the understanding of the groundwater systems has a huge impact on potential um, greenfields exploration and how we move from really an X on the map to a into a three-dimensional uh, search space. So I'm, uh, I'm very excited by what the initial groundwater work has done and identified. And, and we've in fact, um, one of the projects that we've pegged has been a direct uh, outcome and a direct uh, result of the quality of the anomalism seen in some uh, groundwater samples taken by GA. And we're extremely excited. Uh, we're getting a lot more work, but we're in the infancy of understanding of what it, what this actual anomaly means. Um, but so far we're seeing some, uh, you know, very positive outcomes. So uh, I think the groundwater work for the minerals business has been, and how we're using it to to explore this vast country uh, is exceptional, and, and I look forward to the to further developments and understandings of what that what that data actually means, uh, and and assisting us in our future exploration work. So, back to you, Andy. Thanks, Peter. Fantastic. We'll try John again. Now I understand that he's uh, able to speak to us. Is, is that correct, John? I hope so. Is that true? Yes. Nothing. Well done. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> no, no. We can Thank you very you. much. Um, I'm sorry that uh, for the for the uh, obviously startup, but uh, can I go back and and, and attempt to uh, give my thoughts on the greatest benefits of, of this amazing study? Uh, the first thing I'd like like to do is congratulate you all for not just the data, the the information, the way that you've actually 
uh, analyzed it. I think the 63 scientific papers are incredible. I believe that they're just the tip of the iceberg, uh, a huge amount of data, and, and the way that you've been able to link some of the old with the new, uh, very, very important in terms of that collaboration. It's interesting in energy that offshore, we do get regional seismic lines. Uh, we have group shoots, spec shoots, and, and onshore, which you would, where you would expect uh, our, our industry to actually do things such as regional, no, we, we suffer from postage stamp geology in a, in, in a similar, similar way to, to mining. And this postage stamp geology doesn't lead to a greater understanding of, of our Earth system and all obviously lead to knock-on um, discoveries. I, I equate the, the, um, the project that you've been in in a similar way to the opening up of the United States from the east to the west railway system where huge amounts of resources were actually uh, exposed by that system. Uh, and that approach is, is, is what I expect to see from this first uh, regional traverse of our nation. And it's, it's probably a pretty sorry thing to say that it's the first time that we've done it. The ability that you've had to get to 20 seconds seismically to understand uh, our plates, how the nation was formed, is going to be immensely important, I think, and especially as we get uh, hopefully another two at least seismic lines uh, and evaluation across our nation in, in, the, in the centre and in the south. So I look forward to, to that, that integration. The importance of understanding source rock, the importance of understanding reservoir rock, the importance of understanding seals and regional lineaments uh, are critical to the way that we go about our business. And I think that the Proterozoic Basins will, will obviously open up. The last part of that question, you talked about the, um, you asked what effect on our communities. And I see this being hugely important for our Aboriginal community. If we actually open up new mines, new uh, hydrocarbon accumulations. It gives the royalty stream from the successful commercialization of these accumulations is immensely important for our Aboriginal people and, and allows them to control their own destiny. And I think I get very angry when I see activist groups uh, wanting to shut down the development uh, because they're denying our Aboriginal people a right to this wealth and, and controlling our own destiny. So I think that that's a huge, huge opportunity, uh, but that's the main points I wanted to say on, on question one. Thanks, John. Thank you for those perspectives. Um, maybe Holly, um, Phil talked about filling in the gaps uh, in, the, in the water, uh, water knowledge, groundwater knowledge. Of course, when you go to the gaps, the amount of data that's there is you know, small, I'm wondering if there's anything from your perspective where we can be perhaps using uh, open source data or um, sophisticated modeling techniques to be more predictive perhaps in those areas. Uh, and whether you see that that's actually a, you know, a valuable thing to do and um, whether you've seen, had any experience or success or examples in that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I have to say, to be honest, I haven't seen um, too many examples of people doing predictive um, ground water modeling in, in in new ways i think obviously the um hydrogeology uh, world is probably well established in doing doing some predictive modeling um but probably not in terms of uh, people using you know modern machine learning applications or anything like that i think um yeah in terms of the gaps in that in the data um you know i think uh, phil phil will have a, a a much better knowledge than me on this, but uh, I certainly get the impression that on a local scale around around our operations, uh, we often don't have um, as good enough understanding of the hydrogeological system as we would like, um, and that means that you know it can have impacts on our on our pit, open pit operations in terms of uh, water ingress, but also in terms of how we're kind of drawing down on some of those bore fields as well. Um, so I think there's potentially not not necessarily a a role for GA on that local scale, but I think it, it, I certainly get the impression that we're probably not building 
um, detailed enough models on a, on, a, on a local scale around our operations uh, much of the time. Um, I, I have to probably agree with um, Peter in the sense of what where I see a real key role that GA could play in terms of the use of hydrogeochemistry data to help um, identify potential ore deposits. I think that's you know really quite quite new in terms of people using that in greenfields exploration and huge opportunity there to kind of um, bring that into the rest of the field as you know a, a technique that can be more commonly used. So I think there's a huge opportunity for GA to play that a role in that piece and, and helping people you know, get more out of that uh, hydrogeochemistry data. And back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Holly. I'll go down to another question from our audience. That's an interesting question. Pro putting, I guess, what uh, what we've done in the in a national sense, probably in a, in a global perspective, and interesting to get your perspectives from the private sector. The question is, how can Australia's private sector utilise the experience of GA to develop a knowledge economy in earth sciences and water for a global marketplace? And I wonder if um, start with you, uh, John, on that. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. That, that's an interesting one. I think I think we're we're leading from the forefront. I mean, when, when I, I look at countries like United States or or, or, or Europe, they, they still um, haven't got. Uh, we're, we're a continent, and we're, we're actually opening up a continent made of many different plates. So that understanding, even even though on the west coast of the United States, they're doing it with the San Andreas, that they're, they're obviously doing a lot of lot of work uh, in, in the U.S. Geologic Survey. They're doing some incredible work. But when I compare offshore United States and the Gulf of Mexico, for for example, of what they understand there, down in the it is it is a big difference to what they un actually understand onshore. So I think what we're doing is probably, from what my limited knowledge, is is truly groundbreaking worldwide. So that's why I made that analogy to to the railway systems. And when you go back and understand the railway systems of the United States, I mean, that, that a huge number of resources were unallocated were found during that process. So. That, that's the analogy that I'd like to stick with. I, I, I can't think of um, offshore. I can, but not onshore. Off, offshore, the, the understanding is 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 quite immense from MOR all 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 the way, but but not onshore. So that's all I can really add to, to that thought. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, John. Uh, Peter, from your perspective, perhaps we. We always like the fact that our colleagues from around the world want to join with Geoscience Australia and Australia more generally um, in doing collaborative work and, um, and and using us as a sounding board perhaps for their ideas. So I think I agree with John in many respects, we're, we're ahead of the game, but I'm keen to hear from your perspective, Peter, from the minerals perspective, what your, what your thoughts are on that. Well, I hope I've got the question uh, in my head correct, so I'll if I answer it incorrectly, just please let me know. But anyway, I um, I have a bit of experience in the, the States with onshore mineral exploration, uh, primarily working in uh, the state of Minnesota um, and uh, looking at the way in which GA has dealt with the continent of Australia. I mean, it's not significantly smaller than the US in, in, breadth, in breadth, but um, the US has a very, very different way in which they operate between their geological surveys uh, at a national level than US, USGS and their individual states. Literally a state border, you could be walking across into a different planet uh, sometimes. Minnesota had a uh, some of the geochemical uh, and physical data sets which uh, they generated was some of the best in the world I've ever seen. Uh, and they were outstanding at promoting mineral exploration. You go across um, to the state uh, Wisconsin, I think it is on one side, uh, you may as well pack your bags and forget about um, exploring at all. There is no uh, no base data sets, no pre-competitive data, um, and very little incentive for explorers to, to tackle uh, that part of the world. So certainly GA and the way in which you're looking at the holistic view of the, the continent and working with uh, the states in, in bringing forward all the, the country in, in one 
uniform and and uh, uh, consistent group is, I think, an absolutely outstanding uh, contribution. And and certainly the only way I think it will be, ever be successful is to uh, to work with those surveys and um, and produce uh, the optimal product for for industry to use. So that's my thoughts on that. And hopefully I've answered the question. Thanks, Peter. Yes, yeah, I, I agree with those thoughts entirely. Uh, uh, Phil, from a water perspective, um, how can we show global leadership in in, the, in that in that area? Well, I think we're um, <clears throat> we're pretty well up with the technical side of things. We have good interact with our students going abroad, um, with hydrogeologists interacting, uh, coming in and going out. Um, so I think we're um, we're world's best practice on on that. Um, from a groundwater utilisation point of view, Australia has been very fortunate that we've had the regulations which have meant that we are very conservative users. We are not looking at situations like the United States, Ogallala, High Plains Aquifer, which is I don't know how many hundred feet down below the existing water level, but basically they they don't have the legal um, ability to stop mining of their major aquifers, and it's it's not sustainable. Um, everyone knows about the San Joaquin Valley and the, um, the ground subsidence. Um, we don't have those problems. So we have um, a conservative world's best practice, I think, in groundwater management. Um, we, especially the last um, 20 or 30 years in accounting for environmental dependencies of water, of groundwater, um, I think we're pretty well up with there. We, uh, um, uh, I contributed to a book which Steve Barnett of South Australia edited on um, groundwater management compared with France, France and um, Australia. That's just, just come out. Um, what came out of that is that we're both doing pretty much the same thing. Um, we've both got similar, similar, um, similar sorts of ways of managing things, um, different from the political side, but essentially, um, essentially very similar. So um, I think we're doing pretty well on the world stage. As I said, we're a conservative groundwater manager. Uh, we are not getting into trouble on uh, overutilization of groundwater resources in the main. Uh, it's true that climate change in Southwest Australia has taken us by surprise, and we're kind of working through that. Um, it's not a dire thing, but it's a thing that comes over decades. Um, but we've got time to, to uh, look, at, uh, look at alternatives on that. So um, it probably doesn't answer the question, but uh, those are sort of my feelings on it. I just might comment on the, the, um, the comment before about the hydrochemistry that, um, that CSIRO did a study on the Eastern Goldfields a few years ago, looking at um, a range of um, elements in groundwater sampled from pastoral bores through the Eastern Goldfields. So that sort of information, yes, can be available from groundwater data sets um, uh, and hopefully is one more data set that can um, assist in uh, in renewal discoveries. Thank you. I've got another question from the audience. Uh, Geoscience Australia's CEO talked about a startup, Odyssey Geophysics, which was great to hear. But could the panel please reflect on how the MET sector, that's the mining, engineering, technology and services sector, add more value to the wonder da data and tools that EFTF or the Exploring for the Future program has developed? Holly, if I could uh, start with you about how we, how the MET sector perhaps could add value or augment what we're doing as part of our pre-competitive geoscience programs. Yeah, for sure. I mean, an, an obvious one that comes to mind is that, you know, we've seen a I guess an explosion in the MET sector of uh, companies working, applying machine learning to mineral exploration and any additional pre-competitive data that they can get their hands on uh, will really improve a lot of their models and the services that they can provide uh, back to, to explorers and, and to the industry. So I think that's a, a very clear and, and obvious case of, of how the data can be um, directly used. But there is obviously, of course, the importance there of, of how those those companies can get their hands on that data and how easy it is for them to ingest into the systems that they've built. Um, but on top of that, I think just in general, um, 
there's probably so many uh, opportunities for people in the Met sector to use this pre-competitive data in different ways, whether that's um, from, you know, testing potential new products on, on data that could influence the sector or, um, you know, looking at um, uh, groundwater uses. We, we talked about um, uh, some of the geophysics startups getting involved in in this program uh, and equally even just getting hands on on those kind of data sets can help those companies see um, what data is useful to explorers and where those other you know opportunities might lie so um, by seeing how people are using the data the the met sector can equally say, see whether there's opportunities to uh, provide additional services to um, can help create more of those kind of data sets as well back to you andrew Great, thanks, Holly. Uh, John, your perspective, from energy perspective, and uh, engagement with the Met sector, do you see opportunities for implementation or augmentation um, from them to help your your industry or your business? Yeah, I, I would agree with Holly. I, I think it's it's huge uh, using the data sets that are already uh, correlated. You just look at the seismic alone. I mean, you've got you've got data down to twenty seconds. You've got plate boundaries that. 14, 12, 14 seconds. Uh, that's all unexplored. I mean, you can go in there and zone in on on, on particular uh, areas of that. So the top five seconds or top three seconds. Uh, there's examples of direct hydrocarbon indicators on on one part of, of the line, uh, flat spots. There is uh, a lot of uh, enhancements that could be could be trialed. So using the data sets, I, I think is is it, is key and in, incredibly important. Uh, geochemically, you've gone back and, and, and sampled some of the old wells. And, and, and interestingly, those old wells were were, mi were drilled by mining industry. They weren't drilled by oil and gas, they were drill, drilled by, by mining and for exploring for, for minerals and being able to go back and, and take those samples and run rock, rock aval on them. Rock aval's been around for a long, long time. There must be something ready to, to change Rockerval and and, 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 and and so the mind boggles at the opportunities actually because uh, with the amount of data we've got, I just think of, of you know, we've got one of the world's largest super supercomputers. That was, Doug was a startup, a Western Australian startup is, is now leading in terms of computational power and, and I think you know, the example they used when they were in their and the IPO last week was you know, taking data that the uh, Bureau of Meteorology was was taking, I don't know, three months for. They they knocked it out in 24 hours. So, if you've got private startups being able to actually be disruptive and 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 show uh, governments uh, actually what what can be done, that that's a that's a fine example of of a, of a company that that started from a vision and, and is now a world leading in, in computational ability. So I, everywhere I, I go in this, this study, it's about having a data set, a data set that's controlled, a data set with standards uh, that can be duplicated uh, and, and copied. So that, um, and you've integrated uh, just, just the seismic lines, the, the, the seismic line in the South Nicholson, for example, intersected another semi-regional line. At that point, they put the array not just perpendicular to the direction of the chute, but they put it at 90 degrees so they could reduce the statics and the tie, uh, the seismic tie, so that the interpreter didn't have to go through that uh, onshore nonsense of tying seismic lines. So. Uh, more and more that you look at this data set is more and more opportunity and i think that that's the key is how to get access to to the data and it's freely available easily i mean uh for anyone to get hold of that data not just the the process data but the raw data so you can go back and, and get the raw data uh and then also have a look at the process data as, as well so whew, a, a huge amount of opportunities Thank you, Andrew. That's great. To, that's great to hear, John. Thank you for that. I'll move on to another question that's come up that I think is uh, very pertinent to today, where we where we face ourselves today, 
And it's this, Australia and the world are facing incredible challenges with the COVID-19 pandemic and are likely facing a long road to full recovery. What changes are you seeing in your business or industry as a result of the pandemic? And what do you see, foresee the requirements will be in the future for pre-competitive geoscience information from programs such as exploring for the future? Uh, Peter, I want to maybe start with you on this one. Yeah, well, um, obviously the, the COVID pandemic has been uh, has been felt across every industry, every country, and and almost every person uh, I imagine has seen some significant change in their their life, their work. Uh, you know, the unemployment numbers in Australia are, as they say, historically high levels. Um, uh, it's obviously got a very, very far-reaching and and significant impact on uh, on the on the economies of every country. Now, obviously the the way in which uh, industries can spring back, uh, obviously, is through um, through advancement, through new businesses, through new opportunities um, developed from uh, from potentially new technologies. So, employment's obviously going to be a major uh, input or to the recovery from the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Um, I mean, we'd all love a vaccine tomorrow. I don't know if that's really on our radar for. Uh, something we can we can deal with, but certainly, I believe the 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 globe uh, will bounce back very very quickly uh, once we sort of get the get the place under control, and certainly the requirement for metals um, to rebuild uh, and to to engage and and accelerate development in uh, in countries across the world will be will, will cause a huge draw on some of the commodities that James talked about uh, right from. Day one, copper is one that we believe, uh, as a company, is a fundamental building block for economic development. Uh, and while we're so excited about the opportunities um, in copper and why we're focusing our efforts in, in that particular metal, uh, one of the two metals, and obviously the pandemic has caused all sorts of issues economically, and and the gold price and the and the impacts that's had has been uh, has been fundamental in in spurring on more exploration and more development in that in that commodity. So. I certainly believe the minerals industry has a huge, and the oil and gas industry has a huge uh, ability to to drag the the economies of the world forward out of uh, out of the global uh, pandemic and and um, you know have a huge part to play. So back to you, Andy. Thanks, Peter, and uh, and perhaps Phil from a groundwater perspective. Um, do you see any major changes in your industry or for your business as a result of? pandemic and you know maybe a greater focus on analyzing existing data or or actually um you know data from pre-competitive programs can help support that that recovery as as peter alluded to well i i yes i i, I don't see a great um change through the current environment I and mean, the west australian mining industry has been tremendously successful in um in keeping going keeping their operations going through this um pandemic and the uh, semi-lockdown that we've had in Western Australia anyway. Um, I guess that groundwater interacts with the agricultural sector on the irrigation, the horticulture. Um, that is a, a major um, area of disruption, the, um, the lack of flights to take um, to air freight uh, produce, uh, disruption in the supply lines, the um, disruption in having backpacker pickers. Um, those are the sort of issues which I guess are peripheral to the, uh, the groundwater scene. Um, I'm not really sure that there's anything that um, we as uh, professional hydrogeologists can do about that. Um, I think possibly in the future it would mean that we would produce more agricultural produce, that there would be a mar more of a market for it um, overseas. So uh, in, the, in, in, in the sort of the near future, um, looking, looking a few years ahead at least. Um, so that's really about all I can say, I think, Andrew. Thanks, Phil. Uh, maybe a quick comment from you, uh, John, from an energy perspective. Uh, seeing any major changes? I, I know exploration is down and, and uh, particularly offshore, but um, are there any other major changes you're seeing? Yeah, I suppose that that, that would be the first thing is, is that the the big hit on oil price and therefore on capex of all the major companies 
Uh, so we're going to see um, a slowing down as far as that's concerned. But I think that the, the basic premise is, I'd agree with Phil, that without, going back to Lee Kuan Yew when, when, he, fought, when he led Singapore to, to independence, is that without water and without energy, you haven't got a nation. And I think that with the decentralisation uh, brought, brought about by the pandemic, that self-sufficiency uh, is very, very important in, in um, all these products, and, and the same with food in, 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 uh, in the mining sector. So that is, is an awareness uh, of the importance of infrastructure uh, to ensure that we have got ample amount of uh, energy and, and water is, is critical. And, and I think that Phil was, in his introduction on the importance of water, is that I still think that Australia has got the world's largest dam in the Artesian Basin. And, and, and why? Because it was off limits before. Uh, but now with technology, we really can accurately monitor inflows and outflows. And, and that's what's happening. What the coal seam gas industry in um, Queensland has allowed us to do before we could actually extract the gas, we had to be very, very sure with 3D seismic that we were able to monitor the, the movements. And it goes to what Peter was saying with, with water geochemistry. I still think that water understanding uh, in, a, in a more regional sense, uh, a nation, national sense, is, is very, very important. Why have we got you know, a unique lucerne in the, in, in the Northern Territory growing huge copious amounts of lucerne with fresh water in the centre of Australia and the same with the, with the citrus? So you've got two agriculturists who have broken out with a dream and are, and are now growing very successfully crops in the centre of Australia. So I, I think that that thinking, um, what the pandemic has done is, is made Australians think of more about what we've got in this great nation and the pre-competitive uh, acquisition of large amounts of data allows us to see lineaments in different ways and, and, and understanding the relationship between between um, hydrocarbons and uh, the mining sector. I, I remember the first time I went down into the MacArthur mine and, and, and you actually smell hydrocarbons at the same time that you're looking at, at uh, an ore body. So, uh, and I'm sure that's the sort of stuff that Encounter are looking at, but it's the emplacement, the interaction between water, saline water, hydrocarbon and uh, all bodies that is, that is untouched, that is something that, um, that multiple PhDs, I think, can be, will be written on in the future. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, John. Um, I may have a move for another question. Uh, this one's about data. Uh, it says programs like Exploring for the Future uh, generate enormous amounts of data, which can be a challenge to manage and process. They have great potential for producing new insights. Uh, maybe, Holly, I'll start with you. The, the question is, what are the challenges uh, you and industry face in finding that balance between getting access to big data and perhaps using those products? Um, you know, perhaps I can start with you, Holly, particularly with your experience in the, in the work we're doing with the South Australian go government, um, data versus, yes. I guess, value-add science products. Is the yeah, sure. And I think that <laughs> could, could, could go on in this discussion for quite a while. I think there's lots of there lots of challenges that I think we're facing as an industry around how we use our data. And I think it's interesting, it actually does tie back into the previous question around the impact of COVID, because for explorers, so many people are now unable to go into the field are really focusing on going back to reviewing data with the uh, the gold price as it is, lots of people are doing due diligence on picking up projects and having to use a lot of pre-competitive data as well. So um, I think right now is a good time to be talking about how people are using data. And I think in reality, um, now we're in a situation where we have the compute power and the connectivity to do a lot of large scale big data analysis, but particularly with uh, pre-competitive geoscience data, 
it can be very difficult to get that into a format that it can be used. And, and that's across, you know, um, data from potentially from Geoscience Australia, but also, of course, all the state surveys as well. Um, and it, it's not just necessarily uh, using it in, in large analytics, but I think even, um, you know, most, uh, most geologists that would be having to kind of go and compile uh, current pre-competitive data on any, a new project they pick up would probably still be having to spend a number of months doing that. Uh, because it's quite difficult to actually get your hands on that data in an easy way. So um, I think the real challenge that we have right now is around making geoscience data a lot more accessible and usable for those big data analytics. And we're quite a long way from that. Um, there's a number of companies in the MEC sector looking at that problem, kind of around those kind of data pipelines and, and, and preparing data. But I think you know that's that's really something that we can look to invest in. I think it's, it's an interesting challenge as well for explorers that every single state has a different way of um, kind of providing and managing data, which can be challenging as well. Interesting to see. I mean, uh, Queensland launched their new um, data portal. I think on the first or start of August. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting. Uh, it could be make make life a lot easier for explorers. But um, yeah, really, it is thinking about how uh, people might uh, want to use that data. And I noticed another kind of question pop up in the Q&A there around how you can get the Met, might, the Met sector get involved. I certainly think GA could do, um, be worth kind of consulting with some of these uh, companies in the Met sector who are trying to do big data analytics to say, how would you like this data to be provided and in what format and how would you like to access it? because that's really giving a good indication of the future of where we're going and how people are going to be wanting to use these really large data sets. Um, and I'm sure they'll be able to share some of the struggles they're having now. But yeah, I think that data accessibility, as boring as it may sound, is, is a key issue that I think we're facing in that, in that space. And I'll say it back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Holly. Just uh, noticing the time here, it's a good go, like you say, going all day, it's great, fascinating stuff. So I think I'll, I'll ask one last question of, the, of each member of the panel uh, for their quick response. And it is, um, if you can, in 25 words or less, what is the one thing that you would most like Geoscience Australia to do in the Exploring for the Future program extension that would support your business or, or industry? Perhaps, uh, Holly, uh, I'll start with you. Okay, well, I'm going to just say probably what I just said would be invest in uh, making pre-competitive data more uh, accessible for people in the in the way they want to use that data. Maybe. Thank you. 25 words left. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, John. Uh, yes, I would like to see a plate tectonic reconstruction of Australia uh, using the new data, the, the data that you've acquired. It's found new basins, it's found new lineaments and, and actually revolutionised our thought process. Uh, but we need to go back and, and then put this in a plate tectonics. Um, I'm a little bit uh, old fashioned is that if the, if the present is the key to the past, what I see in those seismic lines is that it needs to be bottom up as well as top down understand the plates because those lineaments cause reactivations, hydrothermal fluids coming through. So I think there is a chance to revolutionise how the industry is actually, I'm talking about the geological industry, is, is, is looking at uh, emplacement of not, uh, not only water, but uh, minerals and, and oil and gas. Huge opportunity. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, John. Peter. Uh, tough in 25 words, but um, certainly I think uh, GA has done an outstanding effort in uh, putting together the conceptual framework for, to allow mineral explorers to, you know, basically identify some of these haystacks that, that may may hold the uh, tier ones of, of years to come. What I think is the area which I'd love to see more and more work on is the, the identification of the distal footprints. So what empirical tools and empirical data sets can we generate that can narrow down or screen some of these uh, camp scale targets generated. So certainly working as working further in those districts and, and looking at new technologies that might be able to to screen some of the great ideas and some of the, the concepts that have been developed by industry. Thanks, Andrew. 
Thanks, Peter. And Phil? Well, I've already mentioned it, but my hobby horse, I guess, is um, filling in a big gap in uh, Central Australia by um, collecting some really baseline information on the canning and officer basins. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Look, uh, no time, we're almost out of time. I wanted to warmly thank all of our panel members for their insightful discussions and perspectives this morning or today. Um, Holly, Phil, Peter and John, thank you very much. You've certainly left us a lot to think about. I look forward to drawing upon much of what we've discussed today as we plan for the next program. Um, I also want to thank you, the audience, for joining us today and for your great questions and comments. Apologies we didn't get to to all of them, but as we said, we will reply um, in an email to those questions and uh, we'll that in the next uh, couple of weeks. I hope that the technical presentations and the Q&A session we've had and the discussions that we've had over the course of the uh, virtual roadshow have been useful to you and will provide benefit to your work and to your own exploration resource development successes, whether you work in you know, minerals, energy or groundwater or other sectors. Uh, all of the virtual road shows uh, will be available on demand for you to come back and view again uh, at leisure. Uh, we will make the links available on our Exploring for the Future web, web page, so I invite you to, to visit that. I also invite you to explore other parts or outputs from the program, uh, including our scientific extent of abstracts, as John mentioned. There's 63 of those there, essentially summarising uh, the great science and novel thinking that we brought to bear on the program. Uh, so they're also available on the website and um, there's also an upcoming program update um, which will be published very soon which will uh, give a high level overview of the of the entire program and its outcomes and benefits and of course there's the online data delivery portal which james mentioned in his um, initial introduction uh, a wealth of information a real treasure trove of data and information which i very much encourage you to to look at and and to investigate for yourself um, um, uh, the link to these resources is in a list on your screen and of course come back to the Exploring for the Future website to find that at any time. And of course none of this work would have been possible without our supporters and collaborators and we also invite you to reach out to us. Uh, a bit like today, you know, tell us what you need, your perspectives on pre-competitive geoscience and what perhaps we could be doing differently um, to uh, better support your, your industries or your, or your research. And tell us how we can work together to achieve that, that, those successes. And that's it from me, and that's it from the panel. I thank you very much uh, again for attending, and um, and uh, look forward to perhaps crossing paths in, in a different forum as we continue our our uh, national coverage of the future program. So thank you very much, and bye for now.